Um, test is Thursday. The test is chapter 11, the second half of it starting at slide 13. Um, so chapter 11 is going to be starting with excess capacity and then we have what the thing about theory and policy, the causes of the business cycle, aggregate demand, aggregate supply, the whole wealth, interest rate, farm purchases, effects, the supply side theories, demand side theories, monetary theories, that's so chapter 11. I made my notes because I was looking through there and then I was like using this little paper to make the test. But I'm like not quite done with it. And then all of chapter eight, which is unemployment, all the labor and that kind of stuff. And then chapter nine, we scratched the surface of today. I'm going to get us to slide 19. It's going to be the starting point. But some of the stuff is going to go pretty fast, so it's really going part way part of the class today. But uh, the starting point is at slide 19, right here. I want to talk about reads on later today. So, um, welcome to that. So then, after this, we, after this past Thursday, then we have like six last days before we have this number four, which is actually during the exam week, and I actually have the schedule so I can give you the exact date if I actually had. My notebook with me, but I was like, I know what I'm doing in class today. I refuse to bring anything other than that little piece of paper. Um, but actually, I can. Bless you. The test is going to be December 13th. So it's December 13th at 11 o'clock. We're taking it during the normal exam time, but it's just another test. So if you get done, if you get done with the other three tests in 30 minutes, we'll land and you can get done with that one in 30 minutes because it's just covering whatever the end of chapter nine then I'm gonna skip a couple chapters and then come back to the time for the last kind of thing. So it would just be for three or four chapters. So, we have any? How many of you voted? I'm going after class. I voted. I, I wanted to get the lady to like me two or three stickers so I could have one and say, Yeah, I voted three times! <laughs> so you, you didn't tell her when you broke the law. <laughs> In that instance, well, I mean, I did not break that particular law. I'm not going to say that I'm not a law breaker. But I mean, Apparently, they gave you stickers for absentee voting, too. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, that was great. Dude. Let's see on uh, this P. Yeah. That's why the board is the screen has the call. Okay. Welcome to my nightmare. So uh did we we started talking about inflation we right? Just a little yeah. bit at least yeah. a slide or two, maybe just maybe here. Yeah, it's both. Yes, okay, good. Uh, inflation is when prices overall go up. Deflation is when prices overall go down. Okay, and then relative price was price of one good in comparison to price of other goods. And we talked about that. I talked about how this is the fun, the foundation of our decision making. Did I talk about that in any way? We look at the price, how it relates to other products. I like Coke. A little bit better than I like Pepsi. Oh, is that right about? Yeah. yeah. I like Coke a little bit better than Pepsi, so if they're the same price, no matter what that price is, if they're the same price, I'm going to get Coke every time. But if that relationship changes, if one of them becomes cheaper than the other, then that's going to change my thinking. And then if one of them, and then, and that's mainly the way we think about it, mainly the way we'll talk about it in chapter, what, at six, maybe in five, in, that's what we do for all of you that are here. Um, but the other way to think about um, relative price and how it is relative to your income. If it's small compared to your income, you don't put much thought into the decision. How much agony and anguish and research and homework do you do in order to buy a candy bar? You don't, because it's small compared to your income. How much research, aggravation, anxious, and whatever do you do to buy a car? A lot, because that's huge relative to your income. So, 
Um, examples of the thinking process thought process here. Um, in 2017, a hot dog was two dollars, a soda was one dollar. Hot dogs are twice as much as a soda. Uh, in 2018, hot dogs went up in price, soda went up in price. But what's happened in 2018? Hot dogs are still twice as expensive as a soda. Right? So did you decision making really change? No. Um, so there's no relative change. No relative change here. Opportunity costs, you would have to give up two sodas to get another hot dog, right? Or you have to give up half of a hot dog to get another soda. If they would do that. Just, yeah, I'm gonna get this hot dog, take three bites of it, hand it back, give me a drink. Uh, just okay. Um, so here's another example. In this case, hot dogs were twice as much in 2017, but now in 2018, a hot dog is a little more than twice as much. So you'd have to give up more than two cups worth of soda to have the amount of money you would need to buy a hot dog. So that changes your thinking a little bit. You're relatively speaking, a hot dog is more than twice as much. So hot dogs, relatively speaking, are more expensive. Uh, this is an example here, which you could have. The price of hot dogs stayed the same, but the price of soda went down. But relatively speaking, so what I'm saying is saying the one would went down, but relatively speaking, a hot dog is more expensive compared to a soda. Right? A hot dog is down more than twice the cost of the soda. Not because the hot dog company did anything, but because the soda company did something. We're kind of okay with that one. But overall, when that relative price changes, it leads to a reallocation or an adjustment to how we use our resources, namely our money, our time, that kind of thing. If soda becomes cheap compared to hot dogs, we may say, well, I'm going to get off my calories in the form of liquid and forget the hot dogs do nothing but drain soda all day. You could do it. Or maybe you just cheat a little bit more one way or, or the other. But your purchasing decisions now are going to be a little bit different. Seen it before two times, so guess what? Here it is again. And I actually using the words income that I have used in place of work wages in chapter eight, in place of work GDP in chapter. Okay, we'll go with that one. Um, nominal income that's the number that's on the front of your paycheck. Real income that is in constant dollars. You just for inflation, how much soda? How many bottles of Dr. Pepper can Jane get bring home with a week's paycheck? Right. That's it. So what you would what Jane would do is sit there, what she could do historically, is my life improved. She could look at how much money did she make this year and what's the price of soda? How many sodas does she make worth of money does she make a week this year? She could do the same math the last year, the same math the year before, the same math the year before, and hopefully she'll see the number of sodas per week that she's getting by working is improving. Right. So that would be a real income increase. Oh, it's going to kill me not getting that. So the real income in the real income in real life, that is your income and taxes. Oh, uh, you can look at it before taxes, after taxes, it doesn't matter. It's just how how far will your paycheck go? Will your paycheck go farther this year than last year, or will it go the same, or will it buy less? Hopefully, it will buy more. Um, so, fun thing for the test, and yes, this is a question, but I do remember doing this one earlier today. Uh, not all prices increase at the same rate. And sometimes prices go down for something while uh, they're going up for other things. Uh, the price of gasoline has been going down the last three weeks because the hurricane might have looked over and they got the refineries and the oil rigs back up and running again. And so the price of gasoline is going down. So the price of plywood going up because people are repairing all the damage from the hurricane. Right. So uh, hopefully in a month or so, the price of generators will go down so then you can buy one before winter hits and get that one. Um, not all prices go up at the same rate. Some go up a little bit, some go up a lot. Um, two of the fastest growing prices in America healthcare, college tuition. 
So if you're an unhealthy college student, guess what? And then your money is going away or debt. Uh, and the other one is not everyone suffers equally from inflation. Some people are going to get hurt more than other people. Some people will benefit from inflation. There are winners when it comes to inflation. Well, the one that has more money. Well, no, the person that has more money. The person that has more money, well, they're still losing because their money, you know, Bill Gates, he can't buy as many Dr. Peppers with the money this year as he did last year. He's got more money than Jenny does, but still the price of Dr. Pepper going up is going to reduce the number of services that you can buy. But the people who are really going to get hurt, hopefully not y'all, because y'all are going to pay rates. The people who really get hurt are the people that are on a fixed income. They don't get adjustments. We do a thing, and we'll talk about it sometime, hopefully this semester, a cost of living adjustment. Actually, we'll talk probably deeper today, but it won't be on the test. But a cost of living adjustment, they do that for Social Security. They say, how much did the inflation rate, what was the inflation rate this year? Ooh, 3%? Well, Grandma's Social Security check is going to go up by 3%. But in the meantime, you know, so they do that adjustment once a year. For the remainder of the year, the price is going up, your paycheck is staying the same. But that's good for her. There are some people out there that got on bad retirement plans because the company wasn't forward thinking and the employees didn't get it, and their retirement benefits don't change. What about that? The company said, Well, we promised you $200 a week when we hired you. We paid you $200 a week when you retired. And well, and it's 30 years later, and what are we doing? We're giving you $200 a week. And yeah, back in 1950, when we first hired you, $200 a week was pretty good money. It ain't that good money anymore. You're the time. Books. Yeah, but now, but hey, but we did what we told you we were going to do, $200 a week. Those people, they really get hurt when inflation goes up. It's the prices are going up, up, up every year, and so they can buy less and less and less and less. Get rid of it. Yes? A lot of people have um, um, salary. Oh, if, you, if they get a pay raise every year, then they're... I mean, you still get get hurt, but just hopefully not as much. You know, if Dr. Pepper goes up by 5% and Jenny gets a 5% pay raise, well, she's getting hurt. She didn't get benefited. It kind of hurt because that pay raise that she got isn't letting her improve her quality of life. So, you know, it still does hurt, but it's not hurting her a whole lot compared to nobody else. But... Winners and losers from inflation depend on, I'm uh, using a different word, the kind of wealth that they own. What they have. What if you own a 1965 Mustang convertible in mint condition? And the price of that car goes up. There's a word there. Winner, right? You're winning because the value of something that you own is increasing. Score if you got that number one comic book for your first edition, Spider Man comic book, or first edition Superman comic book, and it's going up in value every year, you're winning. Inflation, price is going up. The price of something you own is going up, you are a winner there. Right. You have money in a savings account. <clears throat> okay, that's. Okay, you have money in a savings account. Are you a winner or are you a loser when prices go up? That's kind of right, the right answer, whoever's sort of grown that way. You're, you're kind of like Jamie. You're, you put your money in a savings account, and it's earning 1% or 2%. So hopefully the interest you're getting in a savings account is keeping up with the inflation rate. So you put enough money this year to buy 100 bottles of soda into your savings account. Hopefully next year when you take that money out of that savings account, it's enough money to buy 100 bottles of soda. Hopefully it'll buy you more. Because that's why you put it in. It's how much money will grow. If your interest rate, which I'm going to get this, uh, um, the interest rate on the money that you're saving is going is higher than the interest. The interest rate on the money you're saving is higher than the inflation rate. Well, you're not losing inflation. You're you're getting ahead of the game. If your interest rate is lower than the inflation rate, you are losing ground. That's not to say, well, screw it. I'm not going to put any money in the bank. The example is like if you're bleeding, you, know, you put your hand on it. That ain't going to necessarily stop the bleeding, right? But it's going to slow it down a little bit, right? And better to slow it down than to just say, well, screw it, I'm bleeding, and just bleed out, right? So you slowing down bleeding is not stopping it. So here's your 
a homework assignment for this weekend. You have money that you are not planning on spending in the next three months. You have this money sitting in your savings account or checking account. Get it out of there because it's losing ground. Because the interest rate we're getting on our savings accounts and our checking accounts is not equal to the inflation rate. So that money is losing value. It ain't losing value as fast as money that you have that you have buried in your uh, underneath your mattress and buried in the backyard. And, but it still is losing ground. Take that money if you're not planning on spending for six months, a year, something like that. Take it and put it, get it in a CD or a money market or something like that. That is at least earning as much as the interest rate. But else you lose in value. So I looked at my uh, my savings account statement and it says I'm getting 0.2%. 0.2 percent, one fifth of one percent. That's the way a lot of it. I'll talk if we had time. I would talk about why that is the way it is, but we don't have time to just because y'all are way desperately behind. But savings accounts are not paying very well at all. The re number one reason ATMs is killed savings accounts. Because you can get your money out anytime, day or night, anywhere on the planet, so they can't take your money and lend it to other people. Because they can't trust that you're not going to come along at 2 o'clock in the morning drunk and swipe the money at the ATM forever. It used to be hard to get money out of your savings account. You had to go to the bank during banking hours. And of course, the bank, they open late in the day, usually were closed for like an hour or two during lunchtime, direct style things in there. So you only had like six hours a day to get your money out of your savings account. And you had to go to the bank in order to make it happen, and you can't go to the bank and work, right? It used to be hard to get money out of savings account, they could lend us. Now it's easy to get your money out of savings account, they can't lend as much of it, so they ain't gonna pay you jack it with swap. So, get your money out of savings. I mean, the money that you're saving to buy the high def TV and the 4K TV here in, on Black Friday, yeah, keep that in your checking account. The, if you're say, planning on you're saving some money to buy a car when you graduate from Tech or JMU or wherever you're going to go to, get that money in something growing faster because you're not going to spend it anytime soon. So, so, ultimately, it depends on what you own, what you owe. If you are, well, I'll, I'll just start here. Price effects. If the products that you use are going up, slower than the, the price of products you use is going up slower than the price of products other people use, you're not getting hurt as well. Let me start to go with that the example I said a couple of minutes ago. If you're an unhealthy college student, right? What do they say with fast food expenses going on in America? Fast food is growing, healthcare and college tuition, those are the two fastest growing in prices. So if you're a young college student, Prices of a young, unhealthy college student who uses a lot of health care, which prices are going up 8 10 percent a year. College tuition is going up 8 or 10 percent a year. I'm going to eat. And she's already been done. <laughs> Good for her. Uh, but if you are somebody that buys a bunch of soybeans, Prices for soybeans has actually been going down because we can't sell them to China anymore because of the trade thing. So the price of soybeans are going down. So if you feed soybeans to your pigs or something like that, or you use them to help fatten up some cows before sending them to slaughter hard and get you benefit it, right? So if your interests and your expenses are in things where the price growth is slow, you're not getting hurt as much as people whose expenses are in interests are in things where the price is growing best. So this is kind of a bizarre one that you hold in here. If your nominal income goes up faster than inflation rate, that means your real income is going up. Right? That means of the money out there, whatever, Jenny's now able to bring home more Dr. Peppers this week than she could last week. She's now got a bigger piece of the pie there. So those people who have whose incomes are going up faster than inflation rates are getting a bigger piece of the pie. And so what about those of us whose income is going up slower than the inflation rate? We're having a smaller piece of the pie. Our hunk of the pie is shrinking while Jenny's hunk of the pie is growing. And here I am talking about pie and getting everybody hungry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we kind of got around here after 2008, 2009 when everything slowed down and then 
our enrollment started slowing down. We went through like three or four years in a row that we did we did not get a pay raise. Period. And our summer school pay got cut. And it kind of sucked for a while. And they haven't made up for it yet. They finally, a couple of years, they sort of gave us a pay raise equal to the inflation rate. But if you would sit there and look at how much stuff I could buy with my paycheck now compared to how much I, stuff I could buy with my paycheck 10 years ago, I'm not in as good a place as I was 10 years ago. But I'm better off than people that uh, lost jobs, right? Or stuff like that. Well, say, if you own real assets like that Mustang I was talking about, if you own real assets that are increasing value, you're winning. If you own a house and the price of that house is going up in value, score. You buy a 500000 you sell it for one hundred fifty. dollars flip that sucker and make an extra big sell, score. Um, if, that's, if you own the asset, the increasing price is, going, is helping you. But what if you don't own it, but you want to own it? No. The increase in price is hurting you. The, you know, Bobby owns the Mustang that I want to buy. His price is going up. He's getting a grin on his face. I'm getting tears in my eyes. Right? From the same impact there. Well, uh, another like good example of that is around wintertime, people are always scrambling to buy a four wheel drive vehicle. Yes. They're always looking to buy a four wheel drive around wintertime. Yeah, so if you own a four-wheel drive vehicle, prices are going to be going up in a way. Horses, if you want to buy a horse, now's the time of year to buy a horse. If you want to sell a horse, you're about to get hosed. Because it's going to get too cold where people are like, I don't want to be riding a horse out there freeze cold as hell and that kind of stuff. So, and so I'm going to sit here feed this animal for the next five months. I'll ride it two times for the next five months. And there's a lot of people that are looking to get rid of their horses right now. And so the price of the horses are like, you know, okay, I'll give you cut rates, so I ain't got to spend it. So I ain't got to feed it for the next six months. I don't have to add a fairy or come out here and trim the boots for a horse that I ain't right. So they'll take that horse and I'll pay you some $1,000, I'll sell it to you for 800 so I ain't got to it. If you're wanting to buy a horse, score. I can get a good horse for only $800 now. It just depends on who you are, depends on where you're at. Uh, if you, I don't have this, uh, I don't know where this slide is. In the face of inflation, setting aside interest rates at the moment, with prices going up, which would you rather be, a lender or a borrower? With prices going up, which would you rather be, a lender or a borrower? I guess maybe a borrower. Yeah, if you're repeating yourself like that. <laughs> yes. But I'd so, rather be lender. Yeah, uh, my education student picked up on that one first. Uh, <laughs> repeating, uh, here's the thing. Setting aside interest rates. Um, Haley lends me $100. Thank you. It's like, uh, there we go. Okay. Haley lends me $100. Haley has, well, on the line, say so, those are a dollar piece. Okay. Haley lends me $100. She lent me enough money today that I can buy 100 cans. Now, she didn't charge me interest. Oops, shame on you. But thank you. So, I, she gives me $100. She gave me 100 cans. This time next year, when it's time for me to pay Haley back, the price of soda has gone up to $1.10. I walk up to her and I hand her $100 because she didn't charge me interest. And I say thank you. What did I do? I just gave her enough money to buy probably about 89 games. 89, maybe 88, do my better nine. So she gave me 100 cans, I gave her 89 in return. The lender gets victimized here, which is why I talked about before you have to charge an interest rate, at least equal to inflation. Because if she's giving me enough money to buy 100 cans of soda, she needs to be getting back at least enough money to buy 100 cans of soda. And then she's going to want more than that to make up for the inconvenience of the fact that I'm holding her $100 bill for 12 months. All right. So, you have to you have to charge interest. You have to, have to, have to. So, here's the thing. If, for those of you who are looking to buy a 4K TV in the next three weeks, 
Okay, by example. Uh, okay, if you you want to buy a what do we want to buy? What? A hard drive? Yeah. A computer hard drive. Okay. A USB, USB C, internal, external. Okay. Internal is more Unfortunately, the Zara ring up. Yes. Yeah. I, I have a NAS in the house, and I've taken a couple of external hard drives, and I've taken them apart and stuck them in anyway. <laughs> that worked. Yes, it does. It's it's true. True. They, they may not last quite as long as the specific ones made for network attached storage, but hey, depending on like, half the price, when it wears out, it's just that much quicker, you just replace it. Anyway, um, you want to buy a hard drive. If you think the price of the hard drive is going to go down next month, what are you going to do? Wait. Buy you can wait yeah. and buy it later. Hopefully, Sam's going to say, well, I got the $100 to buy this hard drive. I'm going to buy, wait until next month. Fine, I'm going to take my $100 and I'm going to put it in the savings account and I'm going to get that one cent interest so then I have enough money to buy my $100 hard drive for less than $100 next month. So if price is going down, okay, you save and buy later. But what happens if the price is going up? Buy now. You buy now. I've got the $100, I'm gonna buy the hard drive now because if I wait a week or two, I won't be able to afford it anymore. Well, what happens if the price of the hard drive is gonna go up and you don't have the $100? You borrow the money, right? You gotta look at the interest rate and see how that plays out. As far as how much price can go, how much it's going to cost to be borrowed, but then, but let's keep the interest rates out of it. You would borrow the money now and buy. So if you are the lender, if you don't adjust for interest rates, I mean, you don't adjust the interest rate, the lender is going to be when it gets hurt when it comes to inflation because the money that they're getting paid back. Isn't as valuable as the money they lent out in the first place. So it's okay because as far as like 15 percent anyway. Yes. If you be borrower, you're benefiting because the money you're paying back isn't as valuable as the money that they gave you in the first place. So borrowers win, lenders lose with inflation. Oh, uh, I thought it would have been more like eight by now. Okay. One of the biggest things about inflation is it can screw up the economy because it brings down in certain uncertainty. Yeah. We're like, okay, gas went from two two dollars and a quarter to two fifty to three dollars, three seven, four dollars. So means you're gonna stop. And so maybe I better not buy that high def TV or four K TV that I want. I better not buy that new cell phone because I don't know. When the, these price increases, the price of gas, the price of food, the price of housing, all these other expenses are going up, 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 I can't afford to buy as much. Because I'm being paranoid. Not only I can't afford to buy as much because these other expenses are taking a bigger check of my paycheck, but I can't afford to buy as much because I'm afraid because I don't know when this train is going to stop. So that uncertainty that things should be, because we usually feel not happy when prices are going up, right? We're grumbling when prices are going up. Well, the faster prices are going up, the more we're grumbling, the more paranoid we are, the more we worry about stuff. The more our so that uncertainty is going to cause problems in the economy. We're not buying because I'm scared about what might be happening in the future. Because I'm like, if prices are going up, so it's thinking fast, something's going to break. And so I'm not going to buy now, so that means you're not uh, because of paranoia, not for something real, but because of paranoia, you're not buying as much, so that means they're not selling as much, so that means people lose your job. And prices going up, things are going to break. That was the financial crisis of 2008. That's exactly what happened. Prices went up too fast, things broke. Well, I didn't touch it that night. I always did. <laughs> The, big, the, the way we react to inflation is this. Shortened time horizon. I just love that phrase, this time horizon. We don't look, we don't look so far to the future. When things are going weird, things are going sideways, when we're uncertain, we're starting to worry about, well, how am I going to pay my next, get the money for my next meal? 
how am I going to make my next car payment? How am I going to make my next house payment? We're thinking about the near-term stuff. We're not thinking about saving money for graduate school. We're not thinking about saving money to buy a house. We're not thinking about the vacations. We don't think about the future. We're thinking about the right here and right now. Or uncertain things are the less in the future we think. Granted, y'all are all young, so y'all don't think very far in the future anyway. Some of y'all haven't even, you, you ain't even worried about you Thursday. You haven't even started figuring out when you can start studying the test, but you aren't thinking that far ahead. This test is only two, two days away. You still do. I don't know. I need to do that. Right. The older you are, the longer, the, the, the less time horizon you have, but the farther out there you're looking, because when I was y'all say retirement, now I'm worried about when am I going to go partying Friday night, right? So that's my liver. Uh, that's what I'm thinking about when I'm y'all age. That's what y'all are thinking about when you're your age. Uh, it's like a few years ago, I, I sat here and I, like 10 years ago, I sat here and I did the math on when I was going to retire. Because I was able to buy back some retirement credits so to speed up when I could retire. And then I looked at that and I looked at when do I think my daughter is going to be getting out of college because I know I can't retire before then. So I'm like, there's no need for me to buy back any more of this retirement. I would just be buying back the right to retire earlier than I am I'm ever going to be able to. So, what work? When inflation's going up, we don't think about the future. We're paranoid and we're worried about the year and now, and that causes problems. It causes us to. I'm not going to be thinking about buying another house. And much people think I'm not going to be thinking about buying houses. So what is happening? Your houses are going to get sold. Your houses are going to get built. You have a bunch of construction workers at work, right? Real impacts in the economy because of the uncertainty that we're having and the near-term approaches that we're having. Luckily, overall for the economy right now, we're doing so we're doing pretty good. There's there's still some words. Okay, there's your image for the day. There's still sports on there. Some things are improving faster than other things. No. But we're, we're, we're getting a wage increases actually are starting to hit the barrier. Like one of the last things that really started happening, but there we're starting to see that push for wages to be going up as companies are making more money. So, so. Okay, I already talked about this speculation. With if when prices are going up, it gets people to do some. The other word for speculation, gambling. Yep. Sam thinks the price of the hard drive is going to go up now, so he goes in, it goes up. Try that again. Good. Sam thinks the price of the hard drive is about to go up, so he decides I'm going to buy it now. He doesn't know. All right. Matthew thinks that 4K TV he's had his eye on is going to be on sale. Black Friday, so he's waiting. He doesn't know. Unless he's actually gotten the flyer from Best Buy three weeks in advance. Have you? No. So, you know, he doesn't know yet, but where inflation causes some people to be adjusting their behavior because of what they think is going to happen because of inflation. If you think prices are going to be going up, well, let me borrow money and buy now. If you think prices are going to be going down, well, let me save money and not buy now. So, our behavior changes just because what we think happens, not what as well as what actually will happen. So here's the fun one. Uh, Y'all are super fun. <laughs> the music group, the uh, yeah. I, can't, I can't think of a song that's like creepy, crummy, crummy, creepy, crummy, creepy, crummy, crummy. It, that's a real song. I can like this is the name of my album. Yeah, it's one of their back catalog. I mean, I don't know if that one made it on the radio, but probably for good reason. <laughs> yes. Um, the Who, I mean, I can listen to one song at a time. If I listen more to one Who song at a time, I get a headache. Just the way it's just too much grunge and sounded too much like a recording inside a cardboard box. So, anyway. Anyway, enough like that. Oh, Frankie so. Creek. Bracket. When have you ever heard the word bracket before? Math. Okay. Math. <laughs> when else? What? Like mass football. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Really okay. Tournaments. Okay. Construction. Okay. Yeah. Construction. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
taxes. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I applaud your vocabulary. I applaud your vocabulary. Good job. Um, what was it for like? Tax. Oh. My accounting students. Who are my accounting students? Sorry, we don't like numbers. Yes. <laughs> so nice to know y'all are not learning anything in your accounting class. Score, y'all know how much I did talk smack about accounting. I really actually don't like on the accounts this semester, bizarrely enough, but it's accounting okay. So tax brackets. As your income goes up, you get bumped into a higher tax bracket. Because we have this progressive system. If you make less than fifteen thousand dollars a year, federal tax system, and I'm rounding the numbers, you make less than fifteen thousand dollars a year, every penny that they took. How do you how do you pay check? You're gonna get back for, for income not. tax for income taxes. Um, that's not counting Social Security and all that kind of stuff that they also take out. You don't get into that. But, but if you're the marginal tax rates, if you make between zero and like fifteen thousand, you get it all back. If you make between fifteen and twenty thousand, that money they make there, they're gonna tax it like eleven percent. They're gonna get eleven percent of that money. And then if you make more than twenty five thousand to whatever that next. 40,000, what are they going to get like 14 or 15%? I don't know what the numbers are. Here's where things get ugly. Jenny doesn't make much money, all right? Because Jenny has whatever her little sideways food line or Walmart. Line. Food line, okay. Didn't I have somebody from Walmart? Oh, no, not food line. Yeah, I thought you were food line too. Okay, I thought it was the Walmart. Like a oh, you just fixed your hair. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, you are Walmart. Okay. I thought, I, okay. See, y'all thought I was great. Okay, that's not who's up I was like, well, yes. I had the paperwork for it. Uh, see, Jenny doesn't make much money. So she's like, pretty much, I make so little money, Uncle Sam, you need to give me my money back. Because you're either going to give it to me as far as tax, tax refund in April, you're going to give it to me in the form of welfare checks for the remainder of the year, or up to. Just give me my money back because I, I made that little money. Hmm? I didn't show you the yeah. <laughs> So, Jenny is in that situation where she does have the understanding boss that is going to come up to Jenny and say, Jenny, I see the price of Dr. Pepper. Well, the price of stuff has gone up by 3%. I'm going to give you 3% pay rates. She's like, thank you. But what? There are these times in life where when the boss says, Jenny, I'm giving you 3% pay raise, that's going to bump her overall yearly pay from $14,990 to a little bit over $15,000. So guess what? She just crept into the next tax bracket to where now Uncle Sam is going to say, Jenny, I'm glad you're working, but guess what? You ain't getting all your money back anymore, girl, because you made too much money. So it may be the case that the her boss said, okay, Dr. Pepper went up by 3%, so I'm going to give you 3% more money so you can buy the same amount of Dr. Pepper. But then Uncle Sam says, well, I'm keeping a little bit of that. So she doesn't end up for that one little year when this adjustment happens, she doesn't end up with as much money by as much Dr. Pepper. Just for that one year. Just for that one year when she makes the jump to the next tax break. Or well, it could be year after year, well, hopefully. Well, yeah, no, well, it's actually going to be every year after that. Because she's now making more than 15,000 students, Uncle Sam is keeping that extra little bit of money. So, if the boss is going to say, well, okay, I recognize that by giving this pay raise, it's going to end up putting you in the next tax bracket, so you should get 3%. And if Dr. Pepper went up 3%, I'm going to give you 35 to cover the tax. No. Employers ain't going to do that. You end up. When you jump from one tax bracket to the next tax bracket, you end up coming home with a smaller percentage of your paycheck. So that could mean there for the, the, the little bit of time, the pay raise, the year that she jumps from one bracket to the next, that year she ends up bring, getting less doctor credit than she did before. But then hopefully, you know, the year after that, she'll get another pay raise, and hopefully if she's, like, improving her productivity, and she gets a pay raise faster, higher than the inflation rate, and then she'll be able to get more Dr. Pepper, and then minus Dr. Pepper per week, she will grow again and again and again. But you have these little speed bumps there. Kind of sucks. Where your boss gives you a pay raise, and it messes you up. But Jenny's not going to go to the boss and say, well, you know, you, because you don't give me a pay raise, you're going to be in the next test. Put me in the next tax bracket, so no, please do not give me the pay raise. She ain't gonna do that. 
Because guess what? The price of Dr. Pepper is going up, right? So better to get almost as much Dr. Pepper than not quite as almost as much Dr. Pepper. Right? You'll follow that phrase there. <laughs> it works. So the way it, so for you OCD people, this, this slide sort of explains that there are progressive tax system tax go up when your income goes up. Savings will go up. Investment. Oh, see, in this case, savings, investment, and work effort might actually go down because Jamie might be sitting there saying, "Well, if I work more, I'm going to go in the next tax bracket. So let me call in sick so I make sure I don't go over fifteen thousand. So then I get all the all the money from the government, right?" She's playing game of limbo with that fourteen thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars, right? So. But overall, inflation goes up pretty much just about every year. Prices go up. So just about every year, hopefully, we're getting pay raises. But guess what? Just about every year, there are some people that are climbing to the next tax bracket, climbing to the next tax bracket. Um, so if you make under 9000 Oh, it's 9000 like oh, yeah. okay, it's 9000 for a person. It's like maybe sixteen for yeah, a Yeah, 9500 and then it's 12% uh, after that. Okay. Okay. I've been filing jointly for the last 14 and a half years. So the money you get from your taxes is better than you get in the pay. No, what you still want pay raise. And just knowing that you don't get 100 percent of the pay raise because Uncle Sam is gonna be keeping a bigger percentage of it because we talked to the tax bracket. But 90% of the pay raise is better than zero percent of no pay raise, right? You can still want that pay rate. So with the pay rate, you can get at least the hundred and fifty cans of soda instead of hundred. Yeah. They take that. Yeah. It, you know, Jenny, when things settle, maybe she went from getting a hundred cans of Dr. Pepper, maybe up to hundred three. But if they didn't do that adjustment, if she didn't jump the next tax bracket, maybe she would have been able to get a hundred four. It's still hundred three is better than hundred, so she takes the first mile because. But you could have so, some people that they actually end up in that turnaround there where the pay raise is exactly equal to the inflation rate, and so she wasn't making enough money to buy 100. To, the pay raise should have given her 100, but since Uncle Sam is holding on to it, she can only buy 99 for that year, which sucks, but you can't have it. I just sort of realized that, that thing she's first saying was about the color of the Dr. Pepper or you know, all the other yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> That matches the doctor. Mm -hmm. yes. And my hair. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm coordinated. Yes. She's not a doctor. She plays one on TV. Uh, so that is where the test is going to stop. But yeah, that is this chapter nine. We'll go with that. Yes, chapter nine. So that is slide 19 for those of you following along. Get all the traffic or whatever. So it's. Starting with chapter 13 of 11, so it's the rest of 11 all day, and then first 19 slide of chapter 9. That is Thursday, September 11. Starting with slide 13. And then all of 8, and then slides 1 through 19 for chapter 9. Okay. And for some reason, my mouse keeps going from one screen to the other screen, so I can let you clip errors. And okay. This is going to be the beginning, so somebody please mark that. Have that line in your notes so that when you're going to sign up, you'll be So, deflation. Let air out of the balloon. Prices going down can cause a problem for some people. It causes a, re a redistribution of income. As prices are going down, the sellers aren't making as much. Right? So we keep more of our income and we spend it in different places. So where our incomes go, that changes. If prices are going down, the lenders are going to be winning because that money that we're paying back is now able to buy more instead of during inflation, that money that we bought, paid back would buy less. 
you know, with inflation, that money I was paying Kaylee back wasn't enough to buy as many pants of soda she gave me. Or with deflation, the money I'm paying her back, she gave me enough money to buy 100 cans of sun drop, and maybe without even charging me interest, maybe I'm giving her enough money back to buy 100, 500, right? So lenders are going to win, and creditors are going to lose, borrowers are going to lose when it comes to deflation. Because like I said, I'm paying back Haley more valuable money than the money that she gave me. So that is how I, as a lender, am losing. I mean, I, as a borrower, would be losing how she, as a lender, would be winning. The deflation. What's that mind? Well, yeah. I mean, but that, and that, that's the value proposition for, you know, if I'm buying something that I needed, I'm borrowing money to buy something I needed, well, you know, that's just, yeah, I had, I had to do what I had to do. But if I'm borrowing money to buy something because I think if I borrow it and buy it now and I can turn around and sell it in a couple months and make some money on it, well, I just got screwed. You know, just depending on what your what your motives are. But the people that win with inflation are the ones that lose with deflation. Businesses may end up losing with deflation because we're not bringing in as much money. My electric bill is still the same. My rent is still the same, but I'm getting less money per gallon of milk I'm selling. I'm getting less money per gallon of gasoline I'm selling. I'm getting less money per bunny rabbit I'm assassinating, right? But my bills, some of them are staying the same. When prices go down, those people on fixed incomes are winning. Grandma so the government. When prices go up, the government's gonna raise grandma's social security check. But when prices go down, the government is not going to come up to grandma and cut her social security check. Because they try to cut grandma's social security check, grandma's will have a she or cut them, right? They, if, I mean, it's one thing to look at grandma and say, prices went up by 3%, we're going to give you 3% increase. She could be like, what is this? Okay. But it's another thing to be sitting there to try to sell grandma. Look, overall, the prices and stuff is going down in America, so we're going to cut your benefits, but it's okay because you'll have the same purchasing power that you did last year. She's going to be like that. <laughs> yes. No. That ain't going to work. So, grandma's social security benefits never will end up going down. So, grandma's can win there. People on long term contracts are going to be gaining because they still got to pay me. They got to pay me, and the money that they're paying me will buy me more stuff than the money that they were going to pay me before. Score the longer that you're in. If you set some kind of deal, well, I guess in buying and selling, it depends on what side you're on. If I. Let's say, um, I run a gas station. Lovelyne runs a construction company. And Lovelyne says, I want to do a contract to set a price for all the diesel fuel that's going to be going in all my bulldozers and trucks and all that stuff. And she wants to set the price at the beginning of the year so she and I negotiate a contract. And I, we come up with a deal that no matter what, no matter when, I'm going to charge her 250 gallon for diesel. All year. Well, if the price of diesel goes down, well, she gets screwed because she still has to pay me two fifty. I win because she's paying me two dollars fifty cents for diesel when everybody else is only paying two to a quarter, whatever it is. So, uh, uh, when I'm on that side of that long-term contract, I'm winning; she's losing. But flip side, if prices are going up. Well, she gets to only, she only has to pay me two fifty a gallon for diesel where everybody else is paying two seventy five, three dollars for us to sell it there two fifty. So it depends on what side of the contract you're on. But there's a psychological component here too. When prices are going down, businesses are gonna start sweating. Some of you business owners are gonna be grumbling, I'm not making as much money, I got bills to pay. And I'm not making as much money, so you're going to have business owners that are going to be griping and worrying about the, I wonder if I'm going to be able to keep the doors open. So consequently, I wonder if I'm going to be able to keep y'all employed over these next few months. So you end up getting uncertainty back into the economy yet again. 
mortgages and car payments are long term contracts, right? Yes. So it doesn't matter what inflation and deflation you have to pay what you have to pay, right? Yes. Because um, you had the purchase price right off the bat. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Um, so nobody but, wins or loses. Well, for a car, for a car payment or a house payment, you negotiated the bill up front, so it's not like you can really adjust. Now, where, where the the math comes in, if you go in the balance between, well, I could rent instead of buying, and then that calculus becomes different as prices change. But you negotiated the price the day you went in, you bought that car for twenty thousand dollars, that you signed a contract for that hundred thousand dollar house, then you got to pay. Six hundred dollars a month, but that's it is where it is there. Um, so you end up just like you have uncertainty that causes questions when prices go up. You have uncertainty that causes questions when prices go down. Um, who was it that I had had my phone Mustang? Nobody. Oh, Bobby owned Mustang, and but that Mustang used to be worth twenty five thousand dollars. Now it's worth 23. And it's worth 20. And he's like, oh crap, how low is it going to go? You know, this thing is worth about this. Th th I had this car and I was going to use this car to pay me, pay, pay my college tuition. But crap, it ain't enough money. I'm not going to get enough money to pay four years worth of college anymore. Maybe if I sell it now, maybe I'll get enough money to pay three. Or only two. So maybe I need to go in and sell the thing now. So at least I have enough money to get a couple of years of college, right? So then he's selling the car earlier than he would want to. So he's losing money. But then what about the other people that are out there, Ford Mustang owners, 65 Ford Mustang owners? They're like, gee, there's people like Bobby that are sitting there selling their car. So you got people, I, I'm selling, he's selling. So you have a bunch of these 65, 65 Mustangs that are on sale now. So what happens to the price? It goes down even more. So. Just like, so it ends up being, it can be a snowball thing. Just prices go down, cause people to panic and try to sell them before the prices go down even more, and then there's more people trying to panic and put them on the market to sell them, the prices go down. All right, when chicken and egg kind of thing. So, y'all didn't believe me when I said this the other day, but deflation causes problems. Just like inflation causes problems, deflation causes problems too. So when it does settle, we don't really want inflation. We don't really want deflation. What would be ideal? One of those eight economic goals. One of those eight economic goals in the first week of class: price stability. Right? We're kind of that's good. Get all the mystery and suspense out of there. But we're never gonna have price stability of zero. Prices don't go up. Prices don't go down because things happen. If a hurricane comes through and tears up some property, so they've got to be shipping plywood from all different parts of the country over where the hurricane hits, so the so price of plywood's got to go up because there's dri truck drivers have to have their money, right? So prices are going to be changing, so we try to get them as predictable as we can, and since our population is growing and all that kind of stuff, if we can sort of get a steady target range where right, inflation is, we keep it in the two to three window year after year after year, we can cope with that. Because we all kind of know what to expect. If we know what to expect, that takes uncertainty out. If you know prices are going to go 3% this year, and 3% next year, and 3% the year after that, no big surprise. You just know if you run in a restaurant, you need to reprint new menus every year. Raising prices by 3%, right? Boom. And you already know to do it. How do we measure inflation? The way we do it is by doing something called a price index, where we create a basket of goods. That's a very simple thing to explain. What they'll do is they'll go along and they'll say, we're going to have a base year that I have on the next one. We're going to say, like, in 1981, I think that's the last one of the year. How much did price of teens cost in 1981? How much did a bottle of soda cost? How much did a gallon of milk cost? How much did, I don't know, a t shirt, a box of bullets, and a two toothpaste? I'm just making like random stuff. So, so yeah. Like pull like an average one. Yeah. And they, they pull this list of stuff from all different areas of the economy because they're trying to measure the price increase of the entire economy. But the last bit there, I'm just keeping it simple here. 
So they're gonna be, you know, jeans, fresh we use jeans, you know, milk, fresh we use milk, hamburger, bullets, whatever, you know, just whatever the things are that they can use. And they can say, how much did those things cost this year? How much did they cost last year? And how much is that difference in terms of percentage? Boom, the inflation rate. But what they do is we compare going back to what's probably base year. So they'll start out in like 1981. How much did the jeans and the bullets and the t shirt and the bubble gum and milk or whatever it was? How much did they cost in 81 compared to how much do they cost now? And we have this whole percentage number you can look in the front, either front or back inside cover of the textbook, and then you won't cry. Right, so if you get hold of an econ textbook, you can have your price index in there and you can sit there and look at this. For the base year is going to be 100, the next year is 102, guess what price is 1 by 2%. The year after that is 104, because price is 1 by 2%. The year after that, they're 107, because price is 1 by 3%. And just how, what percentage of those numbers line from year after year after year. But we look at a group of things. We don't just look at one thing or two things, it's a whole pile of things. Because like we talked about, some things go up, some things go down. And the three measurements that we use, commonly the three price indexes we use, first is the CPI, you might have heard of, the Consumer Price Index. And that's the price of products that you and I buy as consumers. This is going to be the jeans, the Big Macs, the Coca-Cola, the milk, t-shirts, car, the cost per kilowatt for electricity, I don't know what all they have, them. but they'll have, it's a big pile of stuff. But it's not everything, but you know, they're looking to get common prices of 100, a couple hundred things, but it's got to be a common thing that they can compare. Because they can't be like an iPhone, because there was no iPhone 20 years ago. And then the iPhone this year is different from the one last year, right? Which there is quality improvements in there, so that's why these these things are a little bit fuzzy, and that's why they have you yeah, have to adjust them kind of that because these things really don't capture quality improvement. And gas is the same. Gas is the same. Milk is the same. Jeans are pretty much the same. Especially this thing, Levi jeans. Right? Yeah, they're pretty much the same. But a car is different. Cars are fuel efficient. Uh, think about a car in 1980. How many airbags did they have? Zero. Really? How many shoulder seat belts do they have? Zero. You just had the lap belt. So a car now is a lot more safe. A car now is a lot more fuel efficient. There's, there has been quality improvements over and over and over again for an automobile. So to compare a 1980 car to a 2018 car, it ain't the same thing. That's why you kind of have to adjust these things every once in a while. The PPI's producer price index, this is going to be the cost of things that businesses buy. Remember, we got C plus I plus C plus X. It's CPI is kind of getting the prices for C. The PPI is getting the prices for the I. So it's not the suppliers. Yeah, this is what do companies buy? Wheat. How many of you have ever bought a bag of wheat? I'm going to go through and buy a bag of wheat. They sell no. bags of wheat. Uh, uh, are they in a farmer's market? Well, yeah, they like, yeah. You know, yeah. we don't buy wheat. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be driving down the road eating bag of wheat. Well, no, no, we don't do that. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, wheat, screws, you know, copper, industrial solvents, you know, even that down to the tanks of gas, like helium and neon and that kind of stuff that we don't buy. You know, stuff that businesses are going to buy. So you can look at what is the prices. The business that they're facing, or what are the prices the consumers are facing? And hopefully, these things should be going at about the same rate. Because if it's costing me more for my neon and wheat, well, then I'm going to pass that cost on to my customers for the stuff that I'm selling you, right? So, if my cost is 3% more than my price that I charge, it could be 3% more. Right. So, they, they should be close. There might be a little bit of a delay there because the price of wheat now is going to be increasing the price of bread next week or next month. But they, they, they should be related here. And then the GDP deflator. Remember, we're taking inflation out of the things to look to see did we make more Dr. Pepper this year than in the past? Did we make more hammers? Did we make more work? Did we create more jobs? We're deflating. The GDP is capturing what? All the prices. Producers, consumers alike. This is price from the C, the blood, the C, the I, the G, and the S. 
So this, this is everything where CPI and PPI are sort of the two sides. GDP deflator is another one that's got some from both categories. And here again, all three of these numbers should be close, but it's just which one do you want to measure? Are you having a question? So if they make uh, stuff cheap, consumers buy it, is that hard to switch? Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Tom probably can reboot this computer with less so it doesn't fail the next people. But um yeah, if prices go down, these numbers go down for here. Sure. And if you look, there are times where that has happened. Um like 2009, 2010, 2011. 2000, somewhere in there we had one or two years where prices actually went down, like a quarter of a percent. We had a couple of years where prices basically stayed exactly the same for over that little four year stretch, but then prices are back up to two or three percent a year. Like when I started driving gas, it was like 170, 180. Now it's 250. When I took this job, I was driving a four wheel drive Dodge truck. And we, you know, I was talking to you all about my commute. Yeah. The gas was only a dollar and a quarter a gallon then. So then when it went up to four dollars a gallon, I got a free Honda Civic because the money that I saved on gasoline by getting that car more than made up for the price of my monthly payment to buy the car. So it's a free car. I'm not going to put it in my job. That's only been here for a few years. So just don't worry about the math. But just, I already talked about this. There's, qual there's quality improvements that aren't captured in any of these price indexes, so you a little bit got to take a drink of salt. Plus, um, it, I guess even jeans. Do jeans matter today than they were back then, 20 years ago? Uh, eh, I don't know. Some might be. Milk, pretty much the same. Double A batteries, pretty much the same. As long as you're not talking about them, whatever, super alkaline, whatever, that guy said, but they're plain old. Energizer, pretty much the same, but there are the quality enhancements in there that, that doesn't need to catch him. Do we need to know that in 401? No. I'm not worried about that. So, we've seen it. So, here's it again. Nominal GDP, that's going to be the final output in terms of dollars of the stuff that was made, and a real GDP is the amount of stuff that we made, not measured in dollars, but we take that inflation out. This year, we built, so our economy did nothing but we broke 10 watermelons, okay? And we sold for $5 a piece. That's the entire economy of our nation. 10 watermelons, $5 a piece the whole year, the whole year. So our, our economy this year is worth what, $50. Now, let's let us compare to, okay, 10 years ago, our GDP was $20, but the price of watermelons was only $2 a piece. So what happened? This year we did 10, we made, we made $50, $5 a piece for watermelons, we were having any watermelons? 10. So way back then, we made $20, the price of watermelons is $2 a piece, how many watermelons did we grow back then? 10. So what happened to our economy? It didn't shrink. It didn't grow. We went from making 10 watermelons to 10 watermelons. We employed 10. The workers to the harvest 10 watermelons to the workers to harvest 10 watermelons. Yes. Like singular, singular and part-time. Right. So, um, so that's what you ultimately measure. You, 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 you look at how much work did we do today translated into the old price to compare how much work we did compared to now, compared to back then. And now Connor's here, so we can go ahead and do that. Do not, do not, do not tell him what's on the test. <laughs> Make him watch the recording. If I find out if any of you have told him what to expect on the test, then I'm gonna keep doing it. No, okay, so, so all the tests we <laughs> yeah. uh, it's the second half of eleven starting with slide number thirteen. 
It's all of chapter 8 and then slides 1 through 19 chapter 9. Mr. Skelton, can you hear me? If you ask, yeah, I get a zero. No, my wife gets a zero because that's me. <laughs> oh my god. Oh. Oh, what is the GQEP word that we. Oh, eclectic, wasn't it? Isn't it? I think I saw it on the sign. Eclectic. We talked about eclecticism the other day. I was like, that word. Have you all seen the little thing today? We can start to be some things trying to be about the word of the week. Yeah. Okay, the word. No. Any of you have seen that? Okay, one of you. We need to get the word out. Well, that's your that was bad. That was bad. That was bad. That was bad. <laughs> Absolutely unintended. Okay. So, inflation, price is going up. There's more than one way prices can go up. First, demand for inflation. Prices go up because customers are banging on the door saying, give us donuts and give us death. So, we're like, well, we got to create more donuts for these customers because they're wanting it. So, well, we're, among other things, we're going to find out how bad they want it. And we're going to raise our prices and sell to them, and then we're going to use that money to pay people over time to pay them, right? So the customer saying, I want more, I want more, I want more, is going to cause us to have to raise our prices in order to make the more that they want. So that is the customer pulling things along, demand, pull inflation. What do you think the other one is? Oh. oh. <laughs> Cost push inflation. This is when my cost to produce donuts went up because the cost of flour went up, the cost of gasoline went up. In my delivery truck, I'm not putting gas in my donut. Uh, the cost of flour went up, the cost of sugar went up, the cost of you know, minimum wage went up, which means I got to pay my workers more. But either way, it's going to cost me more per donut to make, so I've got to raise my prices. Raising my prices because it costs me more to do the work, that's cost push. Compared to the, I have to raise prices to meet that increased demand because my customers want more of what I make. Which would you rather have? Okay. Demand pull is much better. Because customers want more donuts. So, in, so they want more, they want more, they want more. Well, we raise our price then. Yes. The customers seem to be okay with it because they want more donuts. And that will allow us to be buying more sugar, buying more flour, employing more workers. So there'll be more donut workers getting hired, more flour makers being hired, more whatever the people that are making the stuff that I'm using and making my donuts. So be a job creation and that kind of stuff. Demand pull inflation, we're okay with that. Cost push inflation, nobody wins. Did anybody win because of the hurricane and went through it? No, the they're raising their prices because well, I guess there's a little bit of demand pull there for the plywood company. So I guess maybe they're they're, they're like the only ones winning, but they got to be careful because if they raise the prices too much, you're going to get burned by the government. But everybody else, it's going to cost me more because it's going to cost me more to do an addition to my house because the price of plywood is higher because it's costing my little local load, so it's not in a hurricane zone, it's going to cost them more to be bringing plywood into their store for me to buy. All right. We'll go with that again. So I guess somebody can win with a hurricane. There's a third one that just for fun of hyperinflation. These two are the main two. This is truly this kind of inflation type, but it's just, I don't know where else to put it. Demand pull and cost push. Hyperinflation is when prices go really, 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 really up. Okay. I talked about my friend growing up in Brazil. Did I talk about yeah. oh, Brazil? Uh, the back in like the 80s, they had a kind of corrupt government and a bunch of food going on there. And so the inflation rate was about 8,000 percent a year. You go on vacation to Brazil for a week. You go if you were to get off the airplane. It did. Go to the counter and say, here's 100 American dollars, give me a bunch of Brazilian real, and you put it in your pocket and you come back a week later and you didn't spend a single bit of that money, you send that real back, they ain't give you $100 in return. They give you like six cents. That's how fast the price is going up. Every day, the price of stuff is going 8,000%. Right? Your mind's around that. 8,000%. 8,000 divided by 352. 
what is that? That's like 20% a day training. What do you want to just roll up? Um, never, like, balance, like, oh, it, it settled out because they finally got a stable government in there, and the corruption kind of went down. So things have steadily improved. I mean, and it is a point. Like, if you ever were, if you're going on vacation there, you don't have your wallet here because the pickpockets are so good at like twenty two percent. I met it. But the, the, the pickpockets are so good. You're standing there on a bus, hold on to the thing, they'll come up with a race plate. Cut, cut, cut. Your wallet's gone and you didn't even know they were there. You don't keep your cash. Well, well I'll, I'll, see, I'll show them. I'll put my cash in my shoe. They can get it out of your shoe. They'll, they'll step on it back your shoe. She pops up, money gone. So you put your cash in your sock, in your shoe. That's the kind of stuff you had to do. Because that, that's what hyperinflation can do for you. Because that bread is going to cost 22% more today than it did yesterday. That dollar loaf of bread is now $1.22 today. And it's going to be $1.44 tomorrow. So what am I going to do? Buy my bread today, right? Because it's going to cost 22% more tomorrow. So that's ugly. Ugly, ugly, ugly. That's ugly. You talk about inflation. Like I said, the, the overall, the more people said that there's um, a good inflation in Manhattan. Well, demand pull is that's almost a good kind. I mean, it's it's good as in which would you rather have cancer or hangnail? You know, just okay. Still, okay, that's not true. But I mean, <laughs> just. I mean, it, it, demand pull inflation is an okay problem to have. Uh, just like having acceptance letters to different colleges is an okay problem to have, um, but it's still a problem. Right? Uh, you can have some people winning, some people losing across the way. Okay, demand. I've loved my donuts. I've been eating donuts for years and years and years. And suddenly, all of y'all are interested in donuts, and all of y'all are lining up at the door, pounding on the door, saying, "Give me, give me, give me donuts." So the price of donuts is going up because y'all finally discovered a wonderful list of donuts that I already knew about. So I'm going to get screwed over because the cost of my donuts went up because y'all finally got on board. So you can demand full inflation. Some people are going to get hurt. All right. People that were already on board with donuts and drinking these at that point. Krispy Kreme donuts. The South Hill donuts, they, they're, they're, they're like they're denser and get very close to the cake kind of donut. I like the lighter, fluffier ones. But have you ever gone like in the Krispy Kreme store and seen them floating and frying, floating and frying at the same time on a little assembly line thing? Okay, you need hey, you need to treat yourself for that. And me, if I ever win a lottery, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to rent a store, a Krispy Kreme store for the day, and I'm going to get to the end of that line, I'm going to get down on my knees, throw my head back with my mouth open, and let your babies drop right in. Uh, if that is one of the things that will happen. But anyway, okay. So um, I did not update this slide. I'm sorry, but but just good point. What? Please, you ever update your slide? I'll let you know. I updated some slides just the other day. Thank you very much for the other slides, not this one. Easier. No, because I'm updating. Well, because. I've been holding off on y'all's count because I'm about ready to do a wholesale teardown and rebuild of my entire slides because I'm doing a wholesale teardown and rebuild of my online econ classes for next semester. Nice. And so they're going to be using the open education textbook that none of y'all are reading. That's going to be the book that they're going to be reading. So I'm going to completely realign things between how I should read the books going forward. And so I got it. It will be updated next semester. <laughs> Thank you. Those of you in 202 will be saying, Fully updated slides. Sorry, I'm not sure. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, correct. You are sorry. Yes. <laughs> That's what I meant. So, inflation rate in the United States, well, we're actually a little bit higher than this now, but here again, think and look, don't focus on the numbers, but relatively speaking, what's going on here. The US, Canada, higher than Germany, Italy, because our economy is actually growing faster than they were. Uh, Europe has been moving a little bit slower than we have. Japan, faster. Russia, higher, almost 8%. Uh, 
Partially they have extra growth, partially they have a little more instability in their government. And then what was going on in 2014? Tor Crimea mean anything to you? Okay, they were kind of like Crimea used to be part of the part of Russia, but can you not part of Russia because Russia had invaded and took over Crimea in the 1600s? And then it was like not part of Russia again, and then it became part of the Soviet Union, and then it became not part of Russia anymore. Once the Soviet Union went away, it's like so, and then the Russians decided, well, we kind of want Crimea because they gives us a warm water port to the south, the Black Sea, kind of thing. Anyway, so they were like invading and stuff. But so developing countries, Brazil was 6.3. Well, four times faster than up. We were back then, but still not as bad. Egypt was 10%, China was only two, Israel's a half percent, Mexico, India, but this. The, the developing countries, their inflation rate is higher, partially because of their governments and their economies aren't quite as solid and stable as ours. So we're more solid and stable than most economies on the planet. So a lot of investors that think when the economy start getting ugly, they're going to invest in America instead of investing in other countries because. Yeah, maybe when things get cooking, things will be cooking in these developing countries faster than here, but when things are getting ugly, they're going to get uglier faster in those developing countries than here. You got the more upside and the more downside in the developing countries. And so these economies, as they, they continue to grow and all, their, their inflation rates are probably going to accelerate faster than ours. Japan, I have on the last slide. Uh, that was, well, Seattle War II, China didn't manage to make the inflation rate more dramatic. Oh, well, no, these fluctuate dramatically from year to year. I mean, like, back then, we were like 1.6, now we're like 2.5, where just a couple years ago, it was zero. A few years ago, I mean, it, they, they just kind of like gasoline goes up and down and up and down, and these kind of go up and down and up and down. But Germany, they rebuilt half of God, well, C plus I plus G plus X. Had West Germany, yeah, the three chunks of West Germany, what belonged to England, what belonged to France, what belonged to the United States, then East Germany was what belonged to the Soviet Union after the war. France, Germany, and I mean France, England, and the U.S. We kind of let our side all merge together and. We, we spent some money, the Marshall Plan, helped them rebuild, and they were moving along. And they were fairly modern. Soviet Union, well, it turns out their economy kind of sucked, so they really weren't pouring resources into helping rebuild East Germany. So East Germany, 50 years after World War II, was only about five years worth of developing their way out of preparing the damage. So then what ended up happening when East Germany, West Germany merged in the 80s? I hope you might uh, when they, they reunited, West Germany, we finally got a look at what's going on in East Germany. They said, oh my. And so they had to do a big increase in gene to spend the money to rebuild the other half of their country. And so they did a big increase in gene. They did a bunch of borrowing money. There's an increase in the I, the business investment, borrowing money and all that kind of stuff. Interest rates were high and all that kind of stuff. And where they all the European economies were trying to merge together and cooperate together with the European Union. The extra spending in Germany was doing was causing headaches for these other countries because we all use the same interest rates, y'all, and Germany, y'all are kind of messing things up because they had a different equation. Um, but they had to do all that rebuilding. And so, guess what? Infrastructure wise, Germany is new, Japan is new. There's not much in either of those countries that's more than 60, 70 years old. Where we got bridges and highways and stuff in this country that's 100, 200 years old. They got bridges and buildings and stuff in England and France and Italy that's centuries. 400 years old. Some of it, two centuries. centuries old. Yeah. They're not really using those things for, uh, for tourist traps now, but yeah. So, yeah. so they, they ended up becoming a modern industrial economy fairly fast because everything they ended up working with was new and well thought out instead of trying to wheedle their way around in a city that was made before horse and buggies really came to me. So, go with me.
Okay. Well, we will stop there. Um, and. Um,